If you have a copy of, of God's Word today, we're going to be looking in the Gospel of John chapter 20. I want to pose a question for you today. What is it you're looking for? Can you look at your neighbor and say, what is it you're looking for? And today we want to consider that question today on, on Resurrection Sunday. As we look into the Scriptures in John chapter 20, we're going to take the time today to read the entirety of the story today. Uh, not assuming that anyone here, not, that maybe someone here has maybe not heard the story before. And obviously we need to hear it again. In John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, the word of the Lord says this. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's John bragging about how he's faster than Peter. And he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And now he's admitting that Peter actually is a little braver than him. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. And he saw... And believed. Can you say he saw and believed? They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked him, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary... Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am sending, ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told that uh, she had told them what she had sa said these things to her. And on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed. Can you say overjoyed? Can you say it louder? When they saw the Lord. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for the reading of your word. I ask God today that this wouldn't just be another Easter Sunday. I ask God today that we will not have arrived on this campus today and leave as we came. I ask God today that you would overwhelm us. I ask God today that you would saturate us. I ask God that you would captivate us with your presence and love. For we ask it in your son's name and all of God's people said... Amen. You know, when I come here on every Sunday morning, uh, one of the things that I try to do, I, I've been coming on this property for nearly 17 years. It'll be 17 years this August. And what I try to do every Sunday morning when I come on the campus is I actually try to look at the campus like I'm a visitor. Because, because what I want to do is I want to make sure that when you all get here that things are as good as they possibly can be. I want to make sure that things are in place. I, I want to make sure that there's no, maybe, no trash lying around. I want to try to make sure that everything is the way it should be. And so I try to come here with a critical eye. A critical eye uh, for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Like, do you have a critical eye? 
It's okay to have a critical eye, but I would ask you, is your critical eye such that you're there to tear down? Is your spirit such that, that, that your criticalness has nothing to do with getting better, but it's actually got to do with maybe making worse? You know, it's amazing to me how, how what we look at often changes the perspective that we have. I asked you to ask your neighbor earlier, so what is it you're looking for? You know, have you ever thought about two people who have gotten into a disagreement? Anybody here ever been in a disagreement? Okay, just wondering. In the middle of that disagreement, have you ever thought, how is it that that person can have that perspective? Like, how is it can that person really see this situation? Because you obviously know they're wrong. Can I get an amen? Like, 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 like they're wrong. But, but really, that's not the right answer, really. If we are to have the mind of Christ and we are in a disagreement with someone, really the idea would be not to look at the speck in your brother or sister's eye, but actually maybe try to examine the plank that may be in your own. Because we, according to what it is we're looking at, often determines the things that we see. And so I pose the question to today, what is it that you're looking for? You know, two people can be standing in an intersection and actually see a wreck take place. But if they're standing on opposite ends of the intersection or the opposite sides of the intersection, they may see two different things. Like, like the guy standing on one side of the intersection, when he sees the wreck happen, he goes, yeah, it's absolutely the truck's fault. I saw the truck swerve out in front of that vehicle and hit that vehicle. It's definitely the guy that is driving the truck is at fault. But then the lady on the other side of the intersection says, it's not that guy's fault at all. As a matter of fact, you couldn't see it, but there was a six-year-old little girl that ran out in front of him. And that's why he swerved, right? We see things completely different. I can remember as a preteen, young teenager, I was sitting around my mama's uh, lunch table after church on that Sunday. And I just made a comment about how bad the message was. And my mom, in a very, very full of grace kind of way, actually explained to me that the pastor's message wasn't as nearly as bad as my attitude. (laughs) Oh, wait a minute. That was my brother. Never mind. I was sitting at the table, and that was my brother. Like, Like, how is that? How can it be? You see, I think there are people on two opposite ends of the spectrum today. But before I share those two opposite ends of the spectrum, I want you you to be honest with yourselves today on this Easter Sunday. You see, a person's background, and you need to listen to this, a person's background, a person's biases, and a person's belief deeply impacts both their perspective and vision of things. It's so... Like on our campus today, we'll have hundreds of people that'll stream onto our property for for Easter Sunday. And I want you to explain that, that many of them are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And it has to do with their biases, it has to be do with their beliefs, and it has to do with their backgrounds. Let me explain it to you. There are some people today, I, I know this is shocking for some of you to believe, but there will be people who will worship with us today on Easter Sunday who are skeptics of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That they are skeptical. I mean, they won't really probably tell many people because they're scared they'll be fronted out for it. But I'm going to tell you, there are people that will come into, onto our property today and they are still skeptical as to whether or not this whole Jesus thing's for real. And I want to say to you, if you're that skeptic, you've come to the right church. I want you to hang around here. I want you to know that you are loved by God. I want you to know that you don't have to have all your T's crossed and all your I's dotted. If you're here and you're not still sure about this person called Jesus, I want you to hang around here as long as you can. And I want to walk with you on this journey that we're on. You see, here's the thing about some skeptics, though. If you're not careful when you come to church on Sunday, you're not going to be looking for the risen Savior. 
You're not going to be looking for Jesus. Actually, what you'll be looking for is to try to prove yourself right. Because isn't that the human nature? Isn't that, isn't that the human nature? I mean, the human nature is always about trying to see things in such a way that, that we can prove ourselves right. How many of you can just be, it's Easter. Well, it's just a good time of confessional. Like, like, how many times, if you're here and you have ever been in a situation where you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt you were right and then you found out you were wrong? Raise your hand. You got the people who raise their hand and then liars. And we'll have a service at the end of the service and you can come and confess your sin because you might have always been right, but you've been lying most of your life, right? Like, so, so if you're a skeptic, you got to be careful. Don't, don't just show up to church to try to, to, try to say, yeah, I, yeah, I disproved it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would challenge you to say, I don't want to look at uh, my beliefs and my backgrounds and my biases, but what I want to do is I want to be in search of the king. God, if you're really there, I'm a skeptic, and I don't know whether or not you exist, but I'm going to show up every Sunday, and I'm trying to align my attention, and I'm going to try to align my focus to, to allow God to move in and transform us because here's the truth here at even at LFCN there have been stories of skeptics who have showed up on this property and before they left the campus they come into a saving knowledge of Jesus and were radically transformed but we can't just pick on the skeptics now I, I want to go on the far other end of the spectrum and I want to talk about all of those people who are, who are like me, you, from an early age, you had a drug problem. You know the drug problem I'm talking about? You were drugged to church every time the doors opened. I had a drug problem. I, I have confessed to you that I've sat in summer revivals. Did any of you grow up in churches where they had summer revivals? Why? Why couldn't you do winter revivals? I mean, the weather's pretty outside. I could be playing. Why not a winter revival when it's 30 degrees? Why summer revivals? And I've, I've confessed to you that I've sat in summer revivals and prayed revival would not break out because I was, ex I was scared they would extend the revival a couple of extra days. That that's me. And i got to talk to you about that because there's some of you that you, you cut your teeth in the church. I mean, you, you know all the Sunday school answers. You, you even go back when they used to have your name on a board in the Sunday school class and you'd actually get a star for every time you come to Sunday school class. And the, the real teachers that went above and beyond, they, they even had a separate graph because if you brought an offering, you'd get a star. Obviously, the preacher was in charge of that. And, uh, and, and you'd get a star if you brought your Bible. And it, I mean, there was a whole, there were all kinds of stars, and it was all about collecting stars. But here's the problem with that. If you've been in the church your entire life, and all you've been doing, listen closely, if all you've been doing is just simply been an heir of your parents' religion, you're almost in bad a situation as a skeptic is. You see, if, if you're just showing up at church and all you're doing is staring at the religion your mom and dad gave you, if all you're doing is coming to church to check the box and to get the star and to feel a little bit better about yourself, I would argue that your perspective is almost as dangerous as the, as the, as the position of the skeptic. Because here's the thing, we don't come to church to chase after religion. We don't come to church to check a box. We come to church with our eyes focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is the resurrected one with Somebody say hallelujah. Give God a clap offering today. That's what we've come to do. And so today we ask the simple question, what is it you're looking for? You see, in John 20, it is full of perspectives and people. Early in the morning, Mary heads to the tomb of Jesus with a perspective of grief and pain. She expects to see the burden of death. However, when she arrives, there is an empty tomb and the death is left. She runs back and tells Peter and John. And Peter and John immediately run to the tomb. And as they run, they aren't sure what they'll find. I mean, can, can Mary be trusted? I mean, has the stress and sorrow that Mary has experienced, has it made her delusional? 
I mean, if the body is not there, then who in the world stole it? And after finding the empty tomb, Peter and John leave with more questions than they had before they got there with no real answers. And so they go back from the empty tomb not knowing what to do. The body was gone, but the clothes of Jesus was still in the tomb. I mean, and they're thinking, you know, it's one thing to steal a dead body. It's something completely different to take off his clothes before you steal him. Like, what in the world is going on? Mary remains in the graveyard. Her sorrow is doubled now. Not only is Jesus dead, his body has been taken. And the questions of the absent body now take over the place next to her feelings of sorrow and pain. So she has sorrow and pain on this side. And she has all of the questions of trying to figure out where his body is on the other this is a nightmare inside of a nightmare. I mean, I want, you to, I want you to be merry for a second. You have experienced your Lord beaten, battered, bruised, and crucified. You show up to the tomb for a little bit of closure, for, for, to try to serve the dead body of your Lord. And now the body is gone. And so that morning you woke up with a nightmare. And now in the midst of this nightmare, you find another nightmare. Because somebody has come in and stolen his body. And then, look at your neighbor and say, and then. Verse 11 happens. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she went bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, the scripture says. You could also put in there, according to the translation, and then. Can everybody say, and then? Say it again. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary... She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. In the midst of the nightmare, inside another nightmare, we see Mary experience the and then. It's the point of despair and the point of death in which it seems like all hope is gone and then. You know, earlier today I talked about us looking for proof of our biases. You know, the human nature desires that we pre prove our presuppositions or the things that we have come to believe to be true. The problem with this is when we have our eyes on trying to prove our own biases, regardless of what the biases are, we find it impossible to be seekers of God. Listen to what I'm saying. When your eyes and your focus is on proving yourself right, what happens is we take our eyes off of becoming seekers of God and placing them on other things. Trying to pro prove religion isn't wrong in itself, but at the same time, tr trying to prove religion right isn't the point. The point is becoming seekers of of God. The point is in the relationship of the resurrected Messiah. Mary was so confused on that day. She was broken and she was distraught. She had seen her Lord killed just a few days earlier and she now goes to the tomb to serve her Lord and to pay his respects. However, the tomb is empty. And her bias says that the body of Jesus has been stolen. 
Mary's and then is found in verse 16. I want to read it again. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. You see, at this point, all of Mary's biases no longer married. Uh, mattered. Mary was blinded by her biases and, and what she didn't know. And then Jesus called her by name. And at the moment Mary heard her name from Jesus, true resurrection was recognized and realized in her heart. What an unbelievable thing. Do you know much about the background of Mary? I actually mentioned it today uh, in our in our uh, sunrise service up on the mountain. You want another proof that he's alive? Get 260 people to show up at a mountain before the light shows and, and be cold. That's another example of resurrection. Now, let me tell you about Mary. Do you know in Luke 8, uh, Luke 8, 2, it says this. In Luke 8, 2, this is how Mary is introduced by Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke says these words about Mary. He says in the text, Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had come out. That's, that's the introduction that Mary gets from Dr. Luke. You know, the number seven is a mystical number. It symbolizes completeness. Most of you know this. The number seven, it, it, it symbolizes completeness. From, from an early age, when I was playing sports, I always either wanted to be number seven for the number of completeness or number three, God the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. And if I couldn't get any of those, I just wanted to be number one just because I wanted to be number one, right? And those were my numbers, right? So this, this number seven is this, is this understanding that Luke is explaining to us the completeness of her possession, she is a woman who is completely possessed by the enemy of darkness. That's who Mary Magdalene used to be. Now we have this woman who has been transformed by the life and ministry of Jesus who now stands in front of the one, Jesus, who has just conquered death and the grave. Mary hears her name called by the Savior and she realizes that her life wasn't only changed for this world, but it was changed for all of eternity. Nothing else mattered with the exception of her resurrected Lord. Nothing else mattered but the resurrection of her resurrection, resurrected Lord. And I want you to get this. Through the centuries, there have been millions of people who have been radically transformed as a result of their encounter with the living God. That's the end then. You see, no skeptic has ever been transformed by his skepticism. I would even have to admit to you today that no person has ever been truly transformed by some knowledge of religion. You see, transformation takes place in the midst of resurrection and resurrection alone. Let me say it again so that I can get a hallelujah from my friends in the crowd. Transformation takes place in the midst of resurrection and resurrection alone. You see, here's what i, I got to say to you today. Have you been in church your whole life? Has your whole life been about it? Do you know all the answers? Can you argue the facts? Uh, can you dress up on Sunday and look really, really religious? Let me say to you, brother and sister, let me say to you, young boy or young girl, that doesn't get you anywhere. There will be plenty of religious people who have not encountered the resurrected Messiah, who will not make heaven their home. Being religious don't get you saved. Going to church don't make you a Christian any more than me going to the airport makes me an airplane. It's about experiencing the resurrected Messiah 
in a way that will transform your life. You see, here's what we need to know. We know who Mary was before, and we now know who Mary was after. Like Luke was like, yeah, let me tell you the list of people who are following Jesus. And what I think I'll add in here is, yeah, there's this one girl named Mary Magdalene. And she was completely possessed by the enemy of darkness. And now she's following Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. You see, there's an and then. There's an and then to the story. We've been in this series leading up to Easter. It wasn't by accident. In, in this series, this, through the shallows, we've been talking about going through the shallow water. And if you've missed any of those, you can get them online. And what we did is we backed this series up to through the shallows to and then. And, and next Sunday, I began a brand new series entitled Into the Deep. You see, we walk through the shallows during the season of Lent, during the season of death, during the season of absence in our lives. We walk through the shallow and we get to Easter Sunday and we get here and it's and then. That's why I even wore yellow and blue socks today because my socks are even resurrected. <laughs> Nick's like, why does dad have on my socks? You've... You know, they're too bright for Nick. He says uh, he would never wear them. I got resurrected socks on today. And then, and then God leads us into the deep. You see, here's the thing. Mary Magdalene was standing in the garden that day as a symbol of the power of a resurrected Lord. And then... We have a video, and then, let's watch this. When I was in my 20s, my marriage fell apart, and that led me on a path of uh, destruction. I was making very, very poor choices, and one day I found out I was pregnant. After combat in Vietnam, I was left with both physical scars and emotional scars. I've gone through two major trials in my life, um, one of which uh, was in my freshman year of college when I fell into an addiction to pornography, and the second one uh, was last year when my mom died of an aggressive liver cancer. As a child, I never grew up in a Christian home. My parents were divorced when I was 14 years old, and uh, I rebelled after that. I started coming to LFCN when I was 14. I ended up getting pregnant when I was 16. Three years ago, I lost my oldest daughter. Drinking and driving. About five years ago, I believe, um, Caleb and I decided we wanted to start um, praying and trying to have children. We got pregnant and we were super excited. I didn't realize how incredibly exciting it would be. I took the advice of the world and I had an abortion. This flawed decision was the beginning of a lonely 25 year period of time. Led to a failed marriage, failed fatherhood, failed life, and failed attempts to erase my memory with alcohol. And I tried at first to overcome both of those things by my own strength, but I came to realize just how weak I really was without the Lord. Led me down the wrong path, and the result of that was about seven years of my life being lost to incarceration. And then I was lucky enough to be paroled to my aunt and uncle's house. Um, I think I tried to handle life kind of my own way. Broken relationships, um, having being a mother, single mother of three kids at that point. Um, a lot of hurt and, and betrayal. After going through all of that, I felt as if God pulled me back to LFCN. I got the call three years ago from the detective, and I got excited for a second, because I thought she was going to get locked up. But the detective says, no, she's at Lynchburg General, and she's not in good condition that I needed to get there fast. Within an hour, 
my daughter did not make it. Um, we had some friends over to tell them that we were pregnant and something just didn't feel right. And I kind of already knew that a miscarriage was starting and... And then... And then... And then... And then someone told me about Jesus. And then someone invited me to a Promise Keepers event where Jesus restored and redeemed me. God has been helping me. I'm still struggling in many ways, but the Lord's strength is truly my hope for overcoming these things. And eventually, I heard what I needed to hear that changed me, and God was faithful in revealing Himself to me in a mighty way. With Him bringing me back here, I feel as if God has brought me so much clarity in His Word. Um, I feel so much love from this church. I wanted to run, and I wanted to run, but I knew I had to take two roads. It was crossroads. It was either going to be with Satan, or it was going to be with Jesus. And I chose Jesus. <laughs> it took me a little while to turn to God and really be interested in his comfort um, but when I did uh, it was sweet and he was of course there with open arms um, and then um, almost two years later this little guy came along. Amen. Dude. I saw the first cut of that, and I'm glad I was in a private place because I wept. And, and here's what I want to say to you. Whether you're, you're that skeptic who, um, who, who came just trying to focus on you being right, or, or whether you're that religious person who has been in the church your entire life, I've got a question for you. Put aside everything else. Put aside all of the complexities of religion. Put aside all of the complexities of life. I've got a question for you. And the question is this. Which side of the and then are you living on? Because there's some religious folk that will show up on Easter Sunday 2018. And the truth of the matter is they're still on the wrong side of the and then. They dress nice and they got a pretty smile and, and, and they can play the church game. But the truth is, their life bears witness that they're still on the wrong side of the end, end then. And then there are skeptics. Maybe those who, who've maybe never really come to believe. But that today God is revealing himself in a new and profound way. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to ask you this question. I want you to ask God this question. Which side of the end then am I living on? I think today that there are those in this room today that saying, Pastor, in my life, I realize that through this simple message on 2018 Easter, that I'm not living on the right side of the end then. When I strip away all my thoughts, when I strip away all my ideas, they don't mean as much anymore. Despite maybe growing up in the church and being a religious person and having all the answers to all the questions, Pastor, I realize today that that's really not what matters. I wonder today in this room, if you're here and you go, Pastor, today I need to get on the right side of the end then. And I, I need God to work and move in my heart and life in a way that will allow me to overcome the death of my life and the 
death of my past. I just need to live on the other side of the end then, Pastor. If that's you this morning, would you just stand right where you are publicly? Church, would you pray? People are praying. They're reflecting on their inner self today. Would you allow God to speak to you? But maybe you're here and you're like, Pastor, today I need to stand on the other side of the end then. Would you just stand right where you are and say, God, I want to give you the victory today. God, I want you to work and move in my heart in a way that would bring you honor and glory. Would you today? Would you just stand right where you are and publicly say, God, I need to be on the other side of the end then. Maybe you're here today and you go, Pastor, I'm going to be honest. Today there are things in my life that represent death. I've already accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I know that He saved me from my sin, but there's some stuff going on around my life. There's some stuff that's going on in my soul that I just need to surrender to God. I want those things to be on the right side of the end then. Would you just stand right where you are today? and Say, Pastor, I'm standing by faith today and believing by faith today. That on this Resurrection Sunday, that you will work and move in that area of my life as well. There have some that are stood. Would you stand? Pastor, there are things that need to be on the other side of the end then. For those, Lord, who have publicly stood this morning on Easter Sunday, 2018, may those things, God, in their life that are not on the right side of the end then, would you redeem it, God? Would you work and would you move? That we would be living, breathing examples of your resurrection. 